This is the second 4.2B video. We're going to look at a new experimental design. It's called a randomized block design. And I'll, I will explain what that is. And then I'll talk about a matched pairs design, which is a special type of block design. So a block is a group of experimental units that are known before the experiment to be similar in some way. And this is expected to affect the response in some, in some manner. So um, people aren't randomly assigned to blocks. They are um, put in the block based on some known characteristic beforehand. And then the randomized block design is the design um, using these blocks consisting of individuals that are similar in some way um, that is important to the response. And then after in the blocks, random assignment is carried out separately within each, within each block. So a randomized block design, it sounds similar to a stratified sample, but this is not a sample. We're not taking samples here. We're just putting them in blocks, which are similar within, but they're different between the, between the blocks. Let's take a look at an example to, uh, learn a little bit more about it. Suppose a mobile phone company is considering two different keyboard designs, A and B, for its new smartphone. The company decides to perform an experiment to compare the two keyboards using a group of 10 volunteers. Four of the volunteers are smartphone users, two males and two females, and the remaining six are non-smartphone users, so three males and three females. The response variable is typing speed, and they're measuring words per minute. So draw a completely randomized design. For a completely randomized design, all experimental units are randomly assigned to one of the two treatments, keyboard A or keyboard B. So just like I've seen before, the 10 volunteers are randomly assigned to keyboard A, five of them, and five to keyboard B. And then we measure the response, how many words per minute they typed, and then we compare the results. But there is a better method for this. Rather than using a completely randomized design, one researcher proposes blocking on gender and another researcher proposes blocking on phone type. How would you decide which one of these two variables to use as a blocking variable and draw the new design? So there is a better method because we have um, four how many? We had four volunteers that were smartphone users, and then the other six are non-smartphone users. So since four of the people already have experience with a smartphone, they might get a head start on their typing speed. And the phone that they've been using could influence the response, which is the, the measure or the um, amount of words they can type per minute. So it doesn't make sense, or it's not smart for us to compare non-smartphone users with smartphone users because this variable, the phone that they use, will influence already their typing speed, the response variable. So what we want to do is we want to block by the variable that it has the strongest association with the response variable. Gender is the other variable that they recommended. And whether they're a male or a female, that's not really going to influence how fast they type. What could influence the response, how fast they type, is the phone that they have experience using already. So we want to block by the phone type and not by gender. So there we go. The phone type has the strongest association with the response variable typing speed. And one thing I want to make sure that I make a note of is that this phone type, the phone type that they have, is the variable that will increase the variability in typing speed. So the different phones add to the variation of the different typing speeds. So that's why we're another reason why we're going to want to block by phone type. So looking back at our completely randomized design, now we're not going to randomly assign to the keyboards until after we've broken them up into the two blocks. So we know. Um, we know which blocks it will be, whether they're a smartphone user or not smartphone user. And then the random assignment will happen after they've been put in their blocks. So 
So here we go. The blocking makes it look a little bit more complex, but we're going to send the six people who are non-smartphone users to the first block. Then the random assignment will send them three, half the treatment A or keyboard A, half to keyboard B. And then we'll measure and then we'll compare the results from block one. And then we'll do the same smartphone. Uh, there were four smartphone users. So we'll take them and randomly assign two to keyboard A, randomly assign two to, to keyboard B, which that says three, it should be two there. So let's fix that. Oops. There we go. Now it says two in A and two using keyboard B and we'll measure theirs uh, words per minute. And then we'll compare from block two and then we'll make comparisons between the, the two blocks. So you don't have to put the, the box around. I just wanted to put the box so you could see it more clearly um, for my design. So now let's look at the last type of design we'll learn. And it's a special, uh, it's technically a randomized block design is what it is, but it's a certain type and it's called a match pairs design. So a match pairs design is a common form of blocking for comparing two treatments. In some match pairs, uh, each subject receives both treatments in random order. In others, the subjects are matched in pairs as closely as possible, and each subject in a pair is randomly assigned to receive one of the treatments. So basically, for match pair design, um, one person will receive both and will compare for that one person. Or if we have subjects that are really similar, then we'll put them in a pair and one of them will be randomly assigned to a treatment and then we'll compare those two. So it doesn't make sense to do a match pairs for all experiments, but in, when, in the instances that it is a possibility, it's gonna be the best design that you can use. So let's look at an example. A manufacturer of boots plans to conduct an experiment to compare a new method of waterproofing to the current method. The appearance of the boots is not changed by either method, the company recruits 100 volunteers in Seattle where it rains frequently to wear the boots as they normally would for six months. At the end of six months, the boots will be returned to the company and evaluated for water damage. Describe a design for this experiment that uses the 100 volunteers. Include a few sentences on, on how it would be implemented. So this obviously is gonna be a good, a good chance to do a match pairs design because we don't want to compare Joe and Jack, which boots had uh, more wear or more wear or tear or which ones had more water damage because what if Jack was in uh, the rain more often than Joe? So we don't want to compare one person to another. It would be best if we treated each person as a block and Jack would get, um, his right boot has the old method or the current method of waterproofing and his other foot has the new method of waterproofing. That way, um, we're only comparing the boots that have been in similar weather. So let me write out the important uh, aspects of this design and then we'll talk a little more about it. So again, each individual is treated as a block and they receive a pair of boots where one is treated with the new method, one is treated with the old method, but there still is an important uh, part for randomness. We have to make sure that um, they're randomly assigned to one of two groups. This is one way we can do it. We randomly assign them to one of two groups where group one applies the method, the new method to their right boot, and then group two applies the new method to their left boot. Another option we could do is we could have each subject determine which boot is randomly or which boot receives the new treatment uh, through some random process. So they could sign, assign a random number to each boot and then randomly generate or look at table D. So could our design be double blind here? And yeah, it could. The only way we could make it double blind is if the person who's wearing the boots doesn't know which boot has the new method and which 
boot has the current method. And then the person who is comparing, it says at the end, they will compare and measure the water damage so that whoever is measuring the water damage at the end would also have to not know which boot received which treatment. Good, so as long as the person wearing the boots and the person measuring the damage, the water damage, don't know which one was treated with the new or the current method, then it could be double blind. And this might be a benefit because if, I, if they know they're participating in this experiment, then they might, not intentionally, but since they're aware of it, they may avoid more, more water with this new treatment. Um, and obviously the person measuring the shoe, if they don't know which one received the treatment, then it'll help them to be unbiased in their measurements.